So I just want to say good morning to all and thank you for coming this morning. I don't know if you know how much of an encouragement you are to me, to each other, uh, to Pastor Dale. He's not here today because he's endeavoring in a work in ministry at another location of believers. So I just want to let us know as we do things, simple things like making the choice to att attend the fellowship, it is an encouragement. <clears throat> so I thought for that encouragement, I would title today's sermon, Just Say No. Just Say No. You know, people say, well, I thought we should pray to God for yes spirit. Yeah, that's fine, you can do that. It's good to say yes to him, it's good to say yes to his will. But why not pray for no spirit as well? Because there are some things we need to just say no to. See, and oftentimes those are the things we struggle with. Around about 1986, uh, First Lady Nancy Reagan started her campaign of just say no. And she was ridiculed. She said, just, just say no. It's like, what about this and that and that? That's just stupid. You can't, just can't say no. Well, at some point, you're going to have to say just say no. Now, she never said, don't do anything else. But she said, the part that I want to emphasize is, just say no. And people said, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. There's too much of, what about this, and what about that, and what about this? Well, you could do all the other things, but at some point, you're going to have to just say no. Now, it is in combination with the other things. It is in combination with the other things. And, and it, it, it is mighty funny that the people that ridiculed her and told her not to start that campaign. Don't do that. Don't, don't. You're going to embarrass yourself. You're going to embarrass the presidency. You're going to embarrass your husband, the president. Now, it's amazing that most of the people that ridiculed her, well, we went through a crack epidemic. And then we went through an opioid epidemic. And then now people are saying, man, where's that just say no campaign? <laughs> see, see, because with this, this, and that, we need that as well. But oftentimes you can preach something too early. When John the Baptist came out of the wilderness saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that was the best message one can preach, but it was a little early because <laughs> they didn't realize who Jesus was. And if we don't know who Jesus is, then why would we listen to a preacher coming out of the wilderness saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Where is he at hand at? Because it can't be this guy because we haven't recognized him yet as the son of God. We haven't recognized him yet as God in the flesh. So this message might be a little early, John. And John said, all I can do is preach what I'm told to preach. So I, I just wanted us to understand the just say no campaign spiritually, just say no campaign biblically. So if you would turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6. And I'm not on the phone, it's just I'm taking advantage of God having me in 2022. This is my Bible app, so I don't want anybody to think... Man, this guy is preaching and on the phone at the same time. Well, it's against the law to text and drive, not to preach and text. So, but I'm not texting, by the way. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to go through verse 3 through 6. Verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having, a, and having in a readiness to revenge all 
disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So I know some may think, how do you really reconcile that scripture with just say no? Well, if I am to be obedient to God, between God speaking and my obedience is an area that I'm dealing with some things. I'm dealing with some powers and principalities on high, not people, not people. If Greg starts to talk crazy, you can go ahead and remove him. But whatever Greg was dealing with is still here. And I am not wrestling against Greg. I'm wrestling against principalities and thoughts. So in between God speaking and my obedience, there's an area where I just have to say no. Because God says do this, and immediately, well, I don't know. Is it really him? Because I don't know. Last time he sounded a little deeper. No, those are the thoughts. Yet, no, I can't deal with that. To get to my yes. Over here, I have to say no to this. You know, it's kind of like a groom standing there waiting for his bride. Well, the last thing he needs to do is start thinking. Because if you start thinking, well, are you sure you want to go forth with this? You sure you're ready for this? You sure you're up for the task? You sure, you know, I mean, maybe you should wait a little while. You ever notice how you should always wait to do what's right. You never have to wait to do what's wrong. You ever had the thought of robbing a bank? You'll never, your next thought would never be, why don't you wait till next year? But if you ever had a thought to get married, well, you sure you're ready? If you ever had a thought to do something wrong, like you ever notice uh, uh, kids are never too young to go to college. They are never too young to go to a frat party. They are never too young to go to Coachella. Coachella, you see 16-year-olds, 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds. But you mentioned marriage. Oh, no, I don't know. Y'all are pretty young for marriage. You sure you're ready? I mean, you're kind of young. You got the rest of your life ahead of you. Yeah, but I want to go to Coachella next weekend. Oh, okay, you need anything? You need some gas money? Uh, you know where a good hotel is to stay? Because I'll tell you, because I was, you know, because I was at Woodstock or whatever, and, and, we have to look at our lives and say, this is funny. This is funny because God is showing us, even in the simplest of things, there's never any thought that I have to cast down any imagination when it is something that's not of God. There's no delay needed. See, now, now, He's talking about and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience. The only revenge for disobedience is obedience, but I can't get to obedience until I just say no, until I cast some things down, some imagination, until I deal with the powers to be, which is the only way I can deal with that is to be in Christ. That's why he says, if I be in you and you be in me, he never once tells us to fight. See, oftentimes we're fighting those thoughts. We're fighting with them. And, and there's nowhere in the Bible where he says, fight those thoughts. When the Bible talks about fighting, it's talking about the good fight of faith. See, we're fighting the wrong people. We're fighting each other. And the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're fighting against the enemy will never win because we were never called to fight the enemy, the devil, the deceiver, whatever you want to call him, Lucifer, the god of this world, the prince of darkness. We were never called to fight that fight. And if we study God's word, we would know why, because we can't win that fight. We did not overcome the world. We did not hold captivity in, uh, captive. We did not die and rose on the third day. See, we did not snatch the keys to death, hell, and the grave. So you see people fighting demons and fighting spirits. It's like, eh, no, no. I, I'd rather serve the one who can fight the 
the darkness, who can, the one who can say, let there be light. And the next statement is, and there was light. It didn't say the darkness fought him and they wrestled for a while. It said, let there be light and there was light. If I say let there be light, a lot of things got to happen. But good thing I serve a God who can say, let there be light. So we have to understand that there is an area of Christianity that we have to learn that we play a part. And part of our part is being able to just say no. See, because there is a deceiver. The Bible says he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. There, there, there are many areas of Christianity where people won't even talk about the enemy. They won't talk about heaven and hell. They'll talk about heaven, but they won't talk about hell. They won't talk about Satan. They won't talk about there's a God of this world. There's a prince of darkness. There are children of darkness. Matter of fact, the Bible says when it comes to wisdom, the children of darkness are wiser than the children of light. We being the children of light because we don't study God. We don't study his word. The Bible says the children of darkness are wiser because uh, we get to a point where we don't understand we have to be in this world, but not of this world. Darkness can only overcome light in the absence of of light, because darkness has to represent light, light, but what we do is we leave our light, which is Jesus Christ. I've got life things to deal with, and I've got church things to deal with. I've got earthly things to deal with, and I've got some godly things to deal with. No, it's all God's business, because you can't take care of any other business without breath. Without breath, you don't have life, so it's all God's business. It all involves his creation. Kind of like the old joke where the scientist tells the, tells the pastor, he said, God made man, God made a man. And I've gotten to the point where our community can make a man. And the preacher said, cool. He said, you don't have a problem with that? And the preacher says, no, I don't. He said, oh, so you recognize that we're on the same level as God. He said, well, no, hold up, I didn't say that. But I would like to know whose dirt you're going to use to start. See, no matter where you want to start, at some point you're going to get to God. You, no matter how you want to put it, you've got to get to God. But we, as children of the light, have not reconciled the fact that we have to learn how to just say no. Between God's word and our obedience, there are some forces we're dealing with. And God says, I can deal with that. The only thing I need you to do is learn how to say, just say no. I can deal with the earth and the winds and the rain. I showed you that in my word when the disciples got scared and they said, go get the one who's sleeping. And the one who's sleeping wakes up and he says, peace, be still. That was Jesus preaching to generations to come. I can deal with the wind and the rain. They have to obey me. Don't worry about that. So, 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 well, but there sometimes in our lives, the 23rd Psalm says, he maketh me lie down and drink past you. You know, come up to still water. But when the waters were rough, Jesus said, I can walk on water. The second boat ride, he walked on water. The first boat ride I showed you, I can talk to the elements. Peace, be still. The second boat ride I showed you, I can walk on water. So I'm showing you what I can deal with. So, so hopefully as he's preaching to us, we can say it's a lot easier to just say no. It, it, it is a lot easier to cast down the imagination that we get between God's word and our obedience. See, see, uh, uh, it's one of those things where sometimes when things are too simple, then they're too complicated. Uh, you, you know, you know kind of like AA say, at some point, before we get into the nine steps, the 11 step, the 12 step, some even have 15 step, at some point before we make it complicated, you're going to have to stand up and say who you are. You're going to have to stand up 
and admit who you are. You're going to have to stand up and say, hi, I'm John, and I'm an alcoholic. At some point, because the rest of it we can't get into until you're ready to admit that. Now, our journey with Christ is we can't get here, 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 and here until right here we stand up and say, for God I live and for God I die. Until this point we can stand up and say, I'm ready to just say no. I know there are forces that are using me, forces that want to attack me, and it's not about me personally. So right here I say I don't take it personal because it's God's will that these forces are trying to hinder. It's God's purpose these forces are trying to hinder. It is 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 what God has for me in my life that these forces are trying to deal with. All I got to do is kind of like standing there with the apple on your head. That's a hard thing to do because it takes so much trust in the knife thrower. And God is saying, but, but I've already shown you who I am. I've already shown you how great I am. And all I need you to do to, 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 to capture, uh, uh, um, to revenge all disobedience, all it takes is obedience. It's just obedience. So one of the things we have to learn is how to just say no. Now, if you would turn with me, just, just, just to emphasize this point, because I want people to go home with this point. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, uh, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Watch this. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. See, see it, 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 would, it would take a brother Greg to come up here and, and to say, uh, uh, you get to a certain point in life when, when you're wrestling with things that it, 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 it will take you not to God, but it will take you to an instant desire to fight people. It will take you to an instant desire to fight words. Well, he said to me, she said to me, I can't believe they said. Well, the Bible said, no, it's not about what they said. It's about the rulers of the darkness it's of this world. It's about the spiritual wickedness in high places. So now all of this gets into a realm that if I could explain it, I, I, I don't know. But since I can't explain it, it just makes me trust more in God. It should make me wait more on God. And it is not a wait in the sense of I'm sitting in the corner terrified of all this darkness and wickedness, and I'm scared, so I'm just waiting on God. No, it's a wait as in waiter, as in serving, as in serving the Lord, serving God as he matures me, as he works through me. So, but at least he's letting me know what I'm dealing with, so I don't chop Greg in the neck, so that I don't kill Brother Greg, because at some point, Brother Greg's going to have a question brought to him. See, see what's going to happen, see, well, he's talking about the pearly gates and all that, but, but, but one of the questions is, you ran well, but who hinders you? Now, the question is, do you want to be the who that hinders someone? Or do you want to be the who that someone can point at and say, man, the struggles I had with Mitch, that hindered me. Lord, I, I, I could have done more for you, but he kept, I had to defend myself against him because he kept wanting to fight me. Do you want to be the who? I always say there's two who's. You have to determine which one you want to be. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that who? Now that's a good who to be. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, there's the second who. For you ran well, but who? See, you don't want to be the who that that person can tell God right there. That person, they hindered me. See, because God is saying, we're going to be held accountable for our works. We're going to be held accountable for our obedience to him. So that's why I said, okay, okay, you didn't do all I told you to do, but 
who hindered you? Who hindered you? So, and that's why he can say that because he's telling us through his word, we don't have to hinder each other because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against each other. Our, our, our issue is not with each other. Notice when it comes to each other, the Bible talks about love. Matter of fact, the one of the scriptures said, don't forget to love one another. And another scripture says, provoke one another to good works and to love. So when, when it talks about each other, on the one hand, it says, don't fight each other. On the one hand, it says, don't wrestle with each other. But on the other hand, it says to love one another. Well, I've got to figure out who's my friend. I've got to figure out who's my enemy. I've got to uh, figure out who's despitefully using me. God said, no, you got to figure all that out. I, I got something here to tell you to love all of us. Even love the enemies. See, because when we're focused on the love of Christ, why would I love my enemy? Well, one, because if, if, if I'm to be an imitator of God, and he said I would, that none should perish, well, I can love my enemy from the fact that I don't want them to perish. And then I can love my enemy because my enemy to me is where I once stood to God. He loved us and sent his son to die while yet we were not just sinners, but enemies. So as I learn more about God, I can see, okay, I see why you say uh, to love them and pray for them that despitefully use you because you stood on the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Okay, I can see how now. So he, 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 he's saying, don't fight each other. Learn the love of God, which would allow us to love each other, to provoke each other. He, he didn't say encourage each other to good works. He said provoke. Provoke is almost an angry word. So on the one hand, it tells Father, don't provoke your children. But then on the other hand, he tells us as believers, provoke one another to good works and to love. Almost a make, agitate, annoy until we can get each other to good works. What are good works? Works that are in the word of God. Works that Jesus said, I only come to do the work of him who sent me, which is the work of God, the work of ministry. Those are good works. Not, not trying to get you to go get my stuff out of the cleaners because I'm because I'm too high and mighty to go get them. Well, you go over there and tell Mitch to give you my stuff and bring it to me. No, he's talking about works of the Father. Heavenly work, kingdom kind of work. If I care about Greg's soul, first thing I'm going to do is get on my knees and pray for him. Then if I care about Greg, the second thing I'm going to do, I'm going to just say no to the thoughts of, well, I don't know. Look at Greg. I mean, it just, I can't believe he's looking at all. Oh, he put his glasses on his head. That's an act of aggression. Oh, when I'm done, no, no. I'm going to just say no to those thoughts. And I'm going to say yes to the word of God, where it says to love one another, to greet one another, to pray for one another. If you see a brother in need, I'd rather just do the word of God and say no to these thoughts. So I just want to leave us with the thought of, just kind of notice, and, 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 and to me, when I think of God, I just start laughing because it's so funny. We don't have to get overcomplicated with this. Just think, whenever us, because we be transparent, whenever us, kid, people, whenever there's a thought to do something wrong, there's never any call for hesitation. But whenever there's a call to do anything right, especially let it be for God. There's always a moment of hesitation. There's always an encouragement of hesitation. And that's that place that I want us to learn how to just say no. Just say no to those thoughts. Just say no. And then just keep them out. Watch for that this week as you go out into the world, as you go out to your homes, deal with you know, your jobs and travel. And then always notice there's never any hesitation when someone wants to do something wrong. But when it's to do something, how many people in your life cause you on Monday and say, I just gave you a call because I want to start encouraging you so you can be pumped up on Sunday to go to that fellowship. I'll be transparent. I haven't gotten that call yet. But I remember there was a day. There was a day 
we, we would call it pre-flight, we would start planning for the weekend on Monday. You know, we had charts and graphs. You know, now, now this club is over here, uh, this food hall is over here, and this is over here. We would start early, but how many have ever had someone encourage them to start early? I just want to make sure, Brother Mitch, I know it's Monday, but you said you wanted to pray Friday. I'm just here to get you excited and get you ready. I'm going to call you tomorrow morning because that will bring us one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then also notice when you look at our lives and in the world how when dealing with kids, whenever it's something right. Talk about marriage and watch how many people. They're too young. They're too young. But now, talk about uh, going to college. Hey, do you know, I was watching the program the other day, 13-year-old girl got invitations to Yale, Harvard, Princeton, uh, a couple of more medical schools, biochemists or something. Oh, that's such a great thing. And I said, wow, 13, is she sure enough? You know, she could be in an environment with Darnia, a dose, and this and that. Oh, no, no, it doesn't matter what your answer is, Kim. That was never the question. It was never a question. It was never a debate. But I guarantee you, if you'd have said, oh, that 13-year-old girl is going to marry a 13-year-old boy. Whoa, 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 we got questions. We got, they're just too young for that. They can, hey, Miss, don't laugh now. You can have a bar mitzvah at 13, but you can't get married at 13. You can go to college at 13, but marriage, mm, you're a little young for that. You want to sing in the choir? Um, just mature a little bit. You want to win an American Idol? Mm, you're a little young for that. Everything that would be right, everything that would be wholesome to God, we say, I don't know, they're a little young for that. I don't know if their minds can handle that. But now you talk about anything else. Oh, got a fellowship uh, in England. Oh, you know how hard it is to get a fellowship in England? Oh, my child got one at 16. We're going to send her to England. Wow, that is great. Congratulations. Good work. Proverbially, shake your hand. Air shake. And it's like, hold on, but you're sending your child thousand miles away. You know, Britain is a foreign country, you know, we did the work talk, you know. Because I was hoping your child's that smart to understand history and you know they are that they're their own country and you know they're gonna be dealing with folks that are in a in a, a, a mentally higher, you know, uh, just you know, can we can we at least sit down and talk about it? talk about what? Talk about what is a great thing she's leaving next week. But like I say, uh, uh, let that child come home and say, God called me to preach. What, at 13? And you say, nobody will be that crazy. Well, you might want to read the Bible because I think they made a phone call when there was a little boy in the temple talking about, now that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he has anointed me to. They said, oh, 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 go get his money. When, 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 when they were in the house healing, they said, go, go get his mama. And then when his mama came, they didn't even wait till he was done to interrupt him and say, your mama's out there. When Jesus said, who really is my mother? <laughs> See, that's why we called your mother. See, another day he said, oh, it's a great thing. I mean, you know, we got barbarians running around here killing and savaging villages. And this man's walking around here. I mean, look at this. Now, if you think it would never happen, look at the description of Jesus and John the Baptist. John don't drink. Oh, that's a good thing. Mm -mm. He's got the devil in him. Well, Jesus drinks. Well, he lets me get along with it. No, he's a wine dipper. See, they've always got something to say. Here's Jesus Christ, Son of God, God made flesh, dwelt among us. Here's John, the forerunner of the Christ, preacher, living in the wilderness, wild honey and locusts, uh, camel skin hair, ain't bothering nobody. Did they get credit for that? No. <laughs> no. See, when, when you're doing something right, folks will always have something to say about you. When you're doing something wrong, they go, oh, good job, good job. Tom's going to go down in history. He's the only man that ever robbed seven liquor stores in five minutes. 
Well, time has come to Chatsworth Lake Community Church Fellowship. You know, every Sunday, they mm, go rock pop liquor stores in five minutes. Uh, we make programs about people like that. Yeah. Uh, we have TV shows about people like that. We just don't have TV shows about people who attend the fellowship. Just, just, we don't have programs about people like Alex who just study the word. We don't have stories about people like Chad. And they're probably losing the story. But, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have stories about young people like Zachary that's just coming to the place. You got to do something outlandish. And you notice the reality shows, if you're watching, the Bible says, and there will be a time where it will go from evil to evil, meaning it'll just get progressively worse. If you watch reality shows, it went from, I can't find a man, help me find a man, make him propose to me, and we're going to call it the bachelorette. I can't really, I don't want to settle down with a woman, but if you as the show can make me settle down, and if I propose, she has to make her say yes, we'll call that the bachelor. Okay, so now we got to show uh, 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 what is married at first sight. I, 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 I've had plenty of proposals. I just don't want to get married. But if you make a show and make me get married, then I'll get married. I won't do marriage things, but you can make me get married. Now, I said the Bible says from evil to evil. Okay, so now we got the show where before you make your decision on marriage, we want you to live with five guys. Because there, because you can't not don't don't laugh. You can't say you can't decide to marry somebody until you know them. So you need to live with these five people to get to know them. See, see, we don't see where it's going, but the Bible tells us where it's going. Now, now you sit there on the bachelor bachelorette and you didn't kiss 30 people. And then you wonder why by the time you get to the end, you have no real desire for this person. You have no real desire for anything. If I make you eat 30 steaks, that 31st steak is not going to taste well. See, but to go from evil to evil, see, we don't realize that there's a point where you just say no. Now, we say, Zachary, that's your generation causing all of this craziness. And we can point at Brother Zachary and we can blame this generation. Well, but I got a question. What happened with Lucy and Rick? Because that was crazy. You mean to tell me a couple can be married and it's okay to sleep in separate beds? I thought one of the benefits of marriage, if I got to take out the trash, if I got to work, if I got to do this, if I got to do that, that's all fine. That's part of marriage. But I thought part of marriage was the bedroom not being the box. But yet, this show tells me it's okay to sleep in separate beds. Now, remember I said from evil to evil. And if that, and if that wasn't enough, now you're going to confuse me. Now you're going to confuse me. Because you told me it was wholesome that you slept in separate beds. But now, Lucy. They slept in separate beds. Where did little Ricky come from? Because the show didn't tell me he was adopted. So now I got to figure out where little Ricky came from. Instead of just letting me know that marriage, as the Bible, I'm just saying what the Bible says, marriage is honor. Just letting me know what the Bible says, which is the bedroom is not defiled. See, see, we'll make it not look so weird. We'll take that which is from God and distort it. Marriage is an institution from God, but then we'll distort it by, oh, we'll make them sleep in separate beds. Well, separate beds couldn't have got us Cain and Abel. Separate beds can't get us Little Ricky. So now they never told me where Little Ricky came from. See, th th those are areas where we just have to say, no, I'm just going to count on what the word of God says. Because even when the world thinks they're being wholesome, yeah, I just have to say no and just count on the word of God because they'll confuse me. Now, even when I watch Leave It to Beaver, my favorite show, uh, I look up to June and War. 
But uh, last time I checked, one of the main problems in marriages today when they take surveys is a lack of sex. Even the wholesome shows didn't help me with that because I never saw June and Ward sleep together. I never knew if they slept in the same bedroom. I never knew if that was even okay. I didn't even know if it was okay for a husband and wife to even dare talk about that word. But, but, but without sex, how do we get to uh, uh, Isaac and Ishmael? If, if it didn't require sex, there would be no Ishmael. We would just wait on Isaac. But because God has put steps in place, then we end up with Ishmael. Because Sarah says, even with the prescribed steps, I can't. So let's help God. Here's that cute little maid servant. Come here and help us out. And God said, but that, that's not what I wanted. That's not what I wanted. But, but, but even when the world calls itself tricking me by being wholesome, it is really not serving me well. So I have to just say no and count on the word of God. Because where there's a lack in the word of God, the world picks it up and says, hey, you don't want to talk about sex? We'll talk about it. You don't want to talk about finances? We'll talk about it. Because we don't, we, don't, we don't talk about either in, in, in the future. We don't talk about savings account. We, you know, we, we don't talk. Just trust in the Lord. Just trust in the Lord. Just trust in the Lord. But you want me to give an offering, all right? That's going to be based on some biblical principles. That's going to be based on a father leaves an inheritance for his children's children. But now, before we get it mixed up, the first inheritance is the inheritance of the Lord. That's the first inheritance of father should leave his children's children. So now, uh, um, the Bible talks about being good stewards over what God has given us. You know, the Bible talks about uh, uh, money. It talks about making friends with the wealthy. Yes, it's in there. You know, the Bible talks about these things, but we act like we don't want to touch these subjects in the fellowship. Uh, uh, and then we look at the marriages and say, why is our divorce rate the same, or arguably in some cases, higher than that of the world? But yet we don't want to touch it. We don't want to touch it. We don't want to touch it. The Bible says, let the older women teach the younger women. Uh, and it talks about, and it gives the prescription of what to teach, but we don't want to touch that. You know what? You're just going to have to learn on your own. You'll figure it out, kind of like the old father and the young son. You keep touching that stove. You'll figure it out. No, why not teach him that the stove is hot? Why not teach him that the TV on the TV tray is heavy and you probably don't want to be around it because I was stupid enough to put the heavy TV on the weak TV tray and it's probably going to fall and hurt you. If I care about you, that's what I will teach you. But if I don't love you, I'll let you go over there and let the TV fall on you. Because the TV fell on me as a kid. Look how I turned out. Yes, let's talk about you for a minute. <laughs> okay? So we have to understand if we love each other, then we'll get into the Word of God and not be so influenced in the world. So when we're in that space between knowing God's Word and God speaking and our obedience over here, this is the space we just have to say no. So that's what I want to encourage us with. Just say no. God bless you and amen.